So now I would like to introduce Dr. Edward Buckley. He is our Professor Emeritus of not only neuro-ophthalmology but also pediatrics. He's one of these people we just can't figure out how he does everything that he does because he's our, uh, not only is he our chair, but he's been a Vice Dean of Education, Vice Chancellor of Education, and he's a uh, dookie at heart, but he did a lot of his training at Baskin Palmer because he has so much business he needs to take care of. We just don't know how he does it all. So here I'll introduce Dr. Buckley. So welcome, I want to echo Dr. Woodward's uh, welcome to Duke University. We're glad you're here. I don't think I've ever seen this auditorium completely full. <laughs> so I've been doing botulinum toxin for over 40 years. And what uh, Julie asked me to do is give my sort of pointers that I've learned over 40 years of treating patients with, with botulinum toxin. So you all know what botulinum toxin, this is an old picture of, of oculinum. Uh, but it comes in a powdered form and we reconstitute it in the clinic, 100 units per vial and uh, single use, which means we throw a lot of this stuff away depending on you know, how much we're using. Botulinum toxin acts to disconnect the nerve from the muscle. It's been very effective in doing so. I'm not gonna go into the fine details, maybe one of my colleagues will, but uh, suffice it to say that uh, it decreases the muscle tension uh, after injection. The early experiments with botulinum toxin uh, were started by Dr. Alan Scott, and it wasn't for blepharospasm or dystonias, it was for strabismus, which is crossed eyes and eyes that aren't straight. He was looking for a non-surgical way to create, create to uh, fix that particular problem, and he discovered that small doses of this stuff, he used a lot of compounds, seemed to work without having much in the way of side effects or risk. So the first human trials were in 1977, and it was really groundbreaking. Uh, and I got involved with it, uh, in, like I said, in 1983 when I joined the faculty here at Duke. So this is what it was used for. So this is a, a classic example. This is an 18-year-old. She was involved in a motor vehicle accident. And what you can see is that she can't pull this left eye out. She's had an injury to that nerve. And the question is how to correct for this. And so what we do is we inject botulinum toxin into the opposing muscle, which allows for that muscle to be weak too and strengthens up the muscle that's been injured. And so we basically inject it into the inside muscle of this uh, young lady looking for a good strong muscle signal to tell us that in fact it's working. And this is what happens. You can see she still can't pull the eye out, but she can't pull the eye in either and that's because of the Botox. And what happens is this outside muscle tightens up over time and helps pull the eye out. And here she is after the treatment. So this is what she looked like before. This is how she can pull the eye over after. This is the Botox effect. And this is the Botox effect has worn off. So that's what it was originally started for. And I got involved in it because my area of specialty is pediatric ophthalmology. And our surgical specialty is mainly eye muscle surgeries. And so we started using this quite a bit. And then we discovered maybe there might be some other uses for it. Now, it wasn't approved for any use other than strabismus, but we thought, boy, we've seen some patients who have blepharospasm and hemifacial spasm and dystonia. Maybe botulinum toxin might be helpful in that group. So a classic example is this uh, woman here is 68 years old. She's had two-year history of spasm. She's tried everything under the sun in order to see if it could reduce it. And not much of those worked. And so back in 1985, Dr. Jonathan Dutton, who would, had joined the faculty here at Duke with me, started using botulinum toxin for blepharospasm. And we had one of the first reports at that point in time about the effectiveness of this in the American Journal of Ophthalmology. And then we were looking to see, well, if you inject botulinum toxin into the face, does it go anywhere? Could it be involve other muscles down the room? And it turns out it can. Uh, but it's not clinically significant. But if you do EMG studies, you can find out that there is some remote effect from botulinum toxin, which is injected into the face. We let the neurology uh, uh, community know in 1986, and then we did some long-term follow-up in 1988, showing that the complications of botulinum toxin were pretty small and, and reversible in most situations. So Jonathan and I go way back with regards to using botulinum toxin in the United States. 
Our technique basically has not changed much in 40 years. The injection sites are around the eye, usually in the upper lid on both sides, along the lower lid, and sometimes up in the brow. The key here is to avoid the levator. So lesson number nine with regards to uh, the needle was when I initially started, I thought a longer needle burrowing underneath the skin would be less uncomfortable than a shorter needle. Well, as it turned out, I was wrong. The shorter needle is much more comfortable than the longer needle, and you can get a smaller gauge needle. So this is an inch and a quarter, 27 gauge needle, and this is a half inch, 30 gauge needle. So multiple sticks with a 30 gauge needle are less uncomfortable than one stick with a 27 gauge, so convert it over. Lesson number eight that I learned over 40 years was that this is one of the less is more, that you get less side effects if you decrease the volume and increase the units versus increasing the volume. So more volume tends to cause more side effects because it spreads more. So five units of botulinum toxin is not just five units of botulinum toxin. It depends on how much you volume you put it in. So if you put it in two cc's, you're liable to get more than if you put it in 0.1 cc. So you get less side effects down here if you have less volume, more side effects if you have more volume. So if you're going to do something, it's better to increase the concentration than it is to increase the volume. The next lesson I learned was that increasing both volume and units really doesn't help much with the drug effect. Usually the drug effect you can get with a certain standard dose and going up on the, on the uh, units and or going up on the volume, well, th that is there. The drug effect you actually get will improve a little bit, but not to the extent that you might think. So but be careful that, again, this is a situation where less is more. What we're worried about is the side effects, and this is the classic side effect. Is she, this uh, young woman here is, uh, had blepharospasm, and she was spasming pretty good. We gave her botulinum toxin, and as you can see, her eyes are kind of wide open. In fact, her eyes are kind of wide open. They don't close, and as she tries to close her eyes, your eyes roll up when you, when you close them, and so if you can't close the lid, you actually see the, the eye go up. So we're trying to avoid this kind of problem or this problem. This is a patient who we did bilateral injections for blepharospasm. She came in the clinic and says, well, doc, I'm not spasm anymore, but I gotta take my lids up in order to see what's going on. So we wanna try to avoid this if at all possible. And of course, then the, the last thing is, not only can you get a droopy lid, which is called a ptosis, but also depending on the situation, you can get an eye misalignment as well, and they can end up with double vision afterwards. Again, the reason is to be very careful with uh, the drug and try to keep it out of the orbit and out of the middle of the lid. Lesson number six, however, is that the side effects completely resolve. So that's the good news. And this is the classic example who we dropped the lid on, on this woman and then over a period of about four weeks, the toxin wore off on that muscle and everything went back to normal. So how do you avoid the ptosis? You gotta stay away from the middle of the upper lid is the issue. And one of the techniques that I've learned to use is to put this upper lid on strength, on stretch, stretch it way over so that when you put this injection in over here by the nose, it's really far away from the middle of the lid, which is where the levator is. The levator is extremely sensitive to this stuff and you just gotta show it the syringe and it usually drops. So you need to make sure you can avoid doing that. And the same thing's true for the lower lid and then also for the brow as well. So this is a this typical results. These are pre-injection individuals and here we are post-injection. And, and it's pretty clear that the drug works and the drug works pretty well. In fact, Lesson number four for me is that you get exactly what you need and you get it again and again and again. So this is a graph from some of our early work which shows the effect of the first injection on, a big, uh, on lid force, on brow spasm, and you can see the sixth injection almost mirrors it going forward. However, 
if you look at the first kind of injection, so this is the first injection for this individual who had a, basically a plus four spasm. They were really blinking big time. And you can see the toxin effect, and then the toxin effect slowly wears off. But what you'll notice here is it never gets back to four. It's now three. And if you keep doing this, it gets to two and it gets to one. So the patients who come in to my clinic now who have been getting Bajolam toxin injections for 25, 30 years, they don't blink that much. But they tell me that if we stopped doing it all together that it, we, they would get back. But we do get never back to the first injection, which is always good. And the other note is that I've not seen it go away. Uh, I've probably got a handful of patients over the years where they came in and said, you know, I'm really not blinking anymore. Uh, and we've stopped doing the injections, but that's, that's pretty unusual. So the other lesson that I've learned is that as patients get older, having followed some of my patients for 25 and 30 years, that you need to decrease the volume and the units with age, and it makes perfect sense. So if you look at a 52-year-old, I mean, she's got a fairly robust muscle underlying the skin here. It's relatively thick and it's relatively active. And so she needs more botulinum toxin than the 75 year old whose skin has gotten thin, whose muscles are now much weaker and have basically atrophied if you will when they get older. So if you keep using the same amount of medication, you're gonna get more complications as the patient gets older. So you need to cut back on, uh, on that. So instead of using two, 0.2 cc's or two and a half units, you might want to consider using 0.1 cc of 1.25 units, which gives you a much weaker effect, but that's all they need. So in summary then, botulinum toxin over my 40 years has been really safe and effective and easy to use. It is less is more, so not using as much volume and not using as many units gets you to where you want to go without the complications. You clearly want to avoid the levator at all costs, and I've found that the long-term results are stable, predictable, repeatable, and effective. But the one, number one lesson that I've learned over 40 years of taking care of patients with botulinum toxin is that you meet the nicest people. Thank you very much for your attention.